Below the boiling mushroom of flame and pulverized earth, first pictures of Japan's atom-bombed cities. Revealed here at ground level is a trail of devastation such as the world has never known. A single bomber, one bomb exploding 1,500 feet above the target, leaving no crater. Half a million people lived in Hiroshima, a town the size of Sheffield. Here and there, an isolated structure reminds the onlooker that here was once a city. From the man-made desert of Nagasaki and Hiroshima to the wide expanse of the New Mexico desert for the aftermath of the atomic bomb test. Equipped with meters to measure radioactivity, lead-shielded tanks bring atom scientists to inspect the results of their work. White canvas boots are worn to prevent picking up harmful particles. Geiger meters testing for deadly gamma rays reveal no injurious radioactivity, discounting Jap stories that men died in agony long after their cities were bombed. The tower from which the bomb was dropped was vaporized. Sand was fused by intense heat into a jade green glass crust. The story swings now to the little Cornish village of Gunnerslake. Here too, people are interested in pieces of green substance. On the waste heap near the old Gunnerslake copper mine, clues have been found indicating the presence of uranium the most potent element in the atom-splitting experiments. Uranium is found in turbinite, a green mineral rock found in the lower levels of the now disused mine. President Truman has declared that all America's uranium-bearing land will be taken over by the government. As one of Britain's potential supply areas, Gunners Lake has a thing or two to talk about. Uranium might make boomtown out of Gunners Lake. Anyway, the prospect makes for conversation. This may be Opportunity Village if the atom bomb rules the destiny of the world. Meantime, the cornerstone of Anglo-American policy is the United Nations Security Council now meeting in London. Its purpose and its objectives are described in a statement by Edward Statinius, Chief American Representative. My purpose in coming to England was to help to build an organization against war, the United Nations. We must organize ourselves against war and tyranny, and want, and unemployment. We have no time to lose. I shall not rest until the United Nations organization becomes a reality. Field Marshal Montgomery can now wear the Royal Tank Badge in his famous Black Beret without the risk of infringing King's regulations. His Majesty has appointed Monty to be a Colonel Commandant of the Royal Tanks, and the regiment honors the occasion in great style in Berlin. Tank men from all over the world attended. Monty first wore the tank beret at Alamey. While the band wore ceremonial dress, there were many of the old and unmistakable 8th Army types around. The parade of one of the Army's most distinguished regiments, held in the most fitting place of all, Berlin. A floating airstrip at sea, British scientists have found a way of increasing the natural surface tension of water, making it possible to build a landing strip on the sea or a floating cross-channel bridge. Its navy name is Lily, so-called from the hinge to sections which look like leaves on a lily pond. 520 feet long and 60 feet across, Lily can handle an aircraft loaded up to 9,000 pounds. Takeoffs are rocket assisted. Lily's whole surface is flexible and cannot break up. By the use of secret arrestor gear, planes can land in safety. Yet another war achievement with a peacetime future. From Bourne End Box, a horrified signalman saw Britain's worst train disaster for 30 years. The 15-coach Perth to London Express dived over an eight-foot embankment and crashed into a field, killing 39 passengers and injuring well over 100. Four crowded coaches were telescoped and shattered. Under the wreckage of the engine lay the dead driver and fireman, last bodies to be recovered. Rescue squads rushed to the scene. NFS, British and American servicemen, WVS and volunteers 
worked with a dogged determination reminiscent of the Blitz. Tragic heaps of personal belongings were collected to assist in identifying the dead. Torn and shattered fragments, many bearing distressing evidence of sudden death, completed a macabre picture. A tragedy of peace with all the violence of war. Edinburgh blazed into celebration for the two-day visit to Scotland of the King and Queen and the two princesses. Star items in the kaleidoscope of the crowded tour included a firework display of pre-war vintage. While the King and Queen visited HMS Rodney at Rosyth, Princess Elizabeth attended a girl guide rally at St Andrew's Hall, Glasgow. The princess was given a tumultuous welcome by an audience of more than 3,000 girl guides and brownies. The princess made a short speech to the rally. As a sea ranger, I am proud to be one of you and proud to be here today. I wish you every success in your work and every happiness in the future. Princess Street, Edinburgh, was the scene of one of the most striking episodes of the royal visit. The city's victory parade and the march past, at which the king took the salute. A naval contingent, 1,250 strong, led the parade. Then came detachments of the Royal Marines, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, the Highland Light Infantry, and the king's own Scottish borderers. The RAF, impressive with fixed bayonets, was strongly represented. The King and Queen with Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret stood for more than an hour while a total of 6,000 servicemen and women, munition workers and administrative services march past the saluting base. It was estimated that upwards of 350,000 people watched the ceremonial. It was given the name Scotland's Parade of Peace. <laughs> 